Okay, um, back from the break. Uh, thank you all for, for joining us. Um, we have uh, Miao Ludo, who's going to tell us um, about DIY bio and uh, trends in biohacking. Miao um, is an interesting fellow. He's um, director, I believe, of the BioFoundry, uh, as well as um, uh, a politician as of late. Um, so I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Awesome, thank you very much, Aaron. Uh, thank you all for coming and listening to me speak. I guess I can skip this slide because we've... <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, I'll just quickly introduce myself. So, as Aaron said, I'm a politician with the Science Party. I got involved two elections ago. Most recently, I ran against Barnaby Joyce. Um, I founded BioFoundry, which is Australia's first open access molecular biology lab. There's now two in Australia. And uh, I do a lot of speaking as a, like an emerging technology evangelist, not just in biotech, but in other things as well. Um, so, th and probably most famously, uh, I'm in the middle of a court case with Opal Transport New South Wales for implanting one of their uh, travel passes in my hand, and that's why the EFF logo's up there. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well, and it, I finally have an audience where I think some of the technical stuff will be received well. Last time I gave a presentation was at um, a cyborg conference in Adelaide, but there was just one family of two parents and three very bewildered children. We're going over NFC specifications during the talk. Okay, so why did I create BioFoundry and, and, and what is kind of biohacking a response to? Um, it's kind of like this. So this is like a, I, I picked this photo because this looks exactly like every kind of university academic lab that I've been into. And I really hate it. It's really sterile. Um, sorry to any academics in the audience. Um, I, when I think of academia, the, the things I think is slow, expensive, siloed thought, so you know, sometimes people on the, the, the same floor of a building don't know that other people in the building are working on exactly the same problem they are. Um, it's exclusionary, so you have to have a degree or a PhD even to, to attempt some of it. It's, it's driven by papers, uh, which inherently makes it a bit anti-competition, and there's a limited amount of employment available. Okay, so biohacking came as a kind of response to this, especially um, <clears throat> non-professionals that wanted to engage in broadly molecular biology, um, but they didn't want to do this, because this is really boring. You kind of go out and collect data points for a scientist. Explore, learn, record. You know, um, a lot of, uh, one of the like, um, examples of this that I've seen is, if you go out with an astronomer, you might just take down data points and then give that to a real scientist who then goes and publishes a paper. But you're not actually a scientist. You're just a citizen going along collecting data. So what we want to do is turn it into civic science where you actually do all the science. So this, this term um, came about during, um, during Fukushima where MIT Media Lab, in particular Joichi Ido, who's the head of that, who also doesn't have a degree, by the way, um, try to think about how do we use hacking as a response and how do we use hack as well? Because there's some things that hackers really don't do well, like shower or hold down jobs. <laughs> um, but there are some things that hackers do really well, and that's like uh, be versatile, be protean, be able to think about really unconventional solutions and to be able to move really quickly. So um, they, this came out of um, Fukushima, it was called Safecast. So this, was the, this is a really important moment for me because it makes that transition from citizen science to civic science. What they did was, they ran, uh, sorry, the, the Japanese government ran out of Geiger counters or scintillation meters to try and work out what the, the radiation levels were. So they contracted hackers to build their own devices and instead of costing $6,000, they only cost $600. The reason that this made, a tr um, and, and basically these were given out to people or you're allowed to build your own. The reason that it transitioned from citizen science to civic science is because you didn't just collect data points anymore. You interpreted the data, you processed the data, and you made decisions about your life based on that data. So you became a real scientist. Um, the maps generated by the citizens collectively were more effective than any, and after three months, the government adopted this map as their own. One of the beautiful things about making all this data open is that it enabled innovation. So you turn something that's like a nuclear meltdown zone into somewhere really fun. So Jun Yamadera, who's a biohacker from Fukushima, uh, put one of the Geiger counters on the back of his bike and then linked the color of his wheels to the Geiger counter. So as you're riding around, you can have a, a, a live view of how radi radioactive the area is, which I think is super cool. OK. <laughs> awesome. Um, OK, so 
what is biohacking then in the, in the context of this? It's microbiology, molecular biology, equipment building, so DIY, building your own equipment, bioinformatics, and grinding. And grinding is the act of putting um, technology inside your body. Now, any, any of these done in a non-academic sense or uh, outside of a university would probably be considered biohacking. It might even be considered if you do it inside a university. I think the, the big focus, though, is that um, a huge difference is that it doesn't necessarily have to be a hypothesis driven in a biohacking lab. So we'll often have a tinkering kind of approach. Um, so I'll talk a bit, a bit now. Um, I founded BioFoundry, I don't even know, like five years ago, three years ago, something like that. It's been a wild journey. Um, and uh, this is the first lab that we set up. So I dropped out of my second honours because I failed the first one. And then uh, I got together with some people. We'd been meeting for about three years by that stage. And we rented a, a room just up the road, actually, uh, on Parramatta Road above Bob Jane Team Arts. We got a, a little 16 square metre space in an artist's co-working space. Uh, and this is what it looked like. So we put the fluorescein in the conical flask so it looks like science. Yeah. <laughs> um, basically, we, we just gathered equipment out of dumpsters and we built some of it ourselves. So probably the most important thing, this workhorse, is uh, a PCR thermal cycler. We've upgraded significantly since. We had a fluorescence microscope that I was so excited about getting and just some basic glassware. It, this space was pretty dodgy though, so we outgrew it. But the cool thing was we were doing some really fun science. If anyone's in bio, you might recognize a couple of people here. Um, so this is like a whole community of people with different skill sets getting together and exploring the microbial world. And I, I love this picture because it kind of symbolizes a, a lot about what I like. And this was on the opening night. So Tuck is actually at the front. He's a synthetic biologist. He, used, he was creating a microscope using a laser and a syringe where the, the water droplet projects the contents onto the wall when you shine a laser through it, which is very cool. It worked for about six seconds. Cool, very cool six seconds though. Okay, so this is where we are now. This is two iterations later. So we've got uh, maybe 20 square meter space at uh, Cicada Innovations. We have PC1 certification that enables us to do most of the cool things except do genetic modification on plants. We can do viruses here though, which is really cool. If you wanted to um, practically employ some of the skills that the last speaker was talking about, um, this is a place that you might be able to do some of that work. So you can make basic adeno-associated viruses for gene therapy, um, you can hack bacteria, and you can generally use most of the stuff. It's a lot tidier now, we've got an intern. Uh, <laughs> okay, so our key project at the moment, we've taken over from uh, this group, Countercultural Laboratories, over in uh, Oakland, just across the bay from San Francisco. This is open source insulin. So this touches on another really important um, distinction that biohackers have. We're, we're generally, for the most part, working at um, making the world or people better. So um, Alex Kelly is in charge of this project and it's basically about making open source insulin using off patent um, versions of it. So most of the insulin now is made inside uh, bacteria. It's recombinantly produced. We take the gene out of a human, put it inside a bacteria broadly, and then get it to overexpress this, this protein. It used to be made from pig pancreases that you'd have to like squeeze to get all the insulin out. Um, but now the co cost of insulin is going up, production's going down, and there are people in third world countries and even some places in China that don't have access to insulin. And this is like criminal. It's basically, there's a whole lot of causes that um, make that so, but we think as hackers, this is a way that we can kind of jump in. And there's a few different groups around the world that are all thinking down these ways. How do we democratize um, pharmaceuticals? I'll talk quickly about this guy. Put up your hands if you know who this guy is. One, the two, <laughs> the biohackers. Um, so this is David Ishii. David Ishii is a, I think I actually have it on the next slide. Yeah, 30 year old oil field plant operator uh, from Mississippi. He dropped out of school in year nine. Um, he went and worked in the oil fields. He started breeding dogs, created a company called Midgard Mastiffs uh, after his house was broken into and started getting curious about the genetics and breeding. Then he taught himself molecular biology and now he's one of the best biohackers in the world. And this is all in the space of three or four years. He's the only biohacker in Mississippi and he built his own lab. Um, he's currently consulting for five separate uh, biotech companies around the world. And this is just such a great example of like what the biohacking movement can do if um, people find them, themselves this way inclined. The FDA is currently writing and rewriting legislation as he does stuff because he's pushing um, to 
fix all of the genetic errors that we have in dogs. Often those came about through selective breeding. One of the problems with uh, breeding dogs for certain traits is you can get a lot of hitchhiker genes come along. You can get a lot of, um, uh, through inbreeding, which is very good at getting recessive traits, can also cause a lot of problems. So he's like, why don't we just use CRISPR, go in and fix all these? The FDA said no. They've reclassified what he's doing now as creating drugs, which is completely bizarre. Um, he is actually very excited because the government's shut down at the moment. <laughs> you made a post about it this morning. Um, so it's really interesting that ordinary citizens that have a passion for molecular biology are now actually steering the course of um, legislation, not just in America, but worldwide. Um, these slides are a little bit out of order, but there's a, there's a theme. Okay, so what might, if, if you don't have heaps of experience in genetics, what might you use a biohacking lab for? So I reckon this is probably the coolest, this is Sasha Carberg. He was in the Bay Area, I believe he accessed BioCurious, uh, Bio which is like the first real biohacker space. Um, he had this problem, every morning when he woke up, there was dog shit on his front lawn. So instead of like doing what any kind of normal person would do, he decided to like over-engineer the solution to the problem. So he went and he got a, te uh, got a whole bag of tennis balls and he went down to the local dog park and he threw them to each dog. He then collected the saliva off the ball, he put it into a test tube, he labelled it, he went back and uh, sequ uh, did basic sequencing on it, and then he sequenced the dog poo until he tracked down who owned the dog and then went and confronted them. <laughs> um, it did stop, which is a fantastic uh, outcome, but I think this, this illustrates one thing that I love, which is uh, biohacking spaces are good if you have a problem to solve. Uh, <laughs> which he most certainly did. I don't know if he's done anything since. The other way that um, non-kind of traditionally trained bio people can really make a huge difference um, is in creating equipment. So this is, this is kind of what drives a lot of the biohacking spaces around the world, is it's quite a low barrier to entry. So if, if you can do any coding, any electronics, if you use a laser cutter, you can help at these spaces. And most of this is um, upcycled computer gear. So this, this centrifuge is actually a hard drive that someone's repurposed and they've laser cut, laser cut some parts. Um, if, you were to put, if you were to have something of this quality in a, a standard academic lab, so it's like a centrifuge, PCR thermal cycler, a nano drop, micros, basic microscope, electrophoresis chamber, you might be looking at like, you know, I don't know, $20,000, $30,000. You can make this for like under 500 bucks. Um, let's skip this one. Uh, some other ways that you can help is by visualizing data. So one of, some of my favorite projects are when um, uh, people, working, uh, people with different skill sets all get together and see what problems they can solve. How am I going for time? Good. Um, so this is from, this is from Life Patch. So the, the guys from Life Patch in uh, Jog Jakarta, Indonesia, have very different problems than the biohackers in Sydney. So we have like an excess of scientific equipment. They can't, ev they can't even afford to buy an Arduino for their projects. So they have to build the Arduinos themselves. Which, which is crazy. They did a river watch program where they really demonstrated this civic science. So they uh, made some simple, they made simple detectors to detect coliform bacteria in the waterways uh, because sometimes there's, there's sewers that go into the, the, the drinking water over there. And they enable people to contribute to this map and show you which, uh, which riverways are safe to drink from and which ones are contaminated. And this is just live updated on a, a Twitter feed and then this is an event they have where they all get together and process that information. Um, I think it's really interesting that each biohacker space in the world fulfills a different kind of problem. So this is Josiah Zainer. Um, he's solving very different problems. So the first, Josiah is an ex-NASA scientist and he had a problem with his guts and then he did a fecal transplant. The results were so huge that he decided to quit NASA and become a full-time molecular biologist. Uh, he's kind of in charge of the American biohacking movement at the moment, and he's most famous for his website, The Odin, which sells reagents and kits to anyone as his mission to democratize science. He got in trouble with um, the EU because he was sending um, DIY CRISPR kits for bacteria um, to Germany, and they, they tried to ban them. They started confiscating them at, at, at events, and they were claiming that he was putting pathogenic bacteria into his kits. One of the problems with having a uh, 
potential pathogen as a model organism is that these types of things can happen. So there was E. coli, which is, which is really common, and we use this all over the place. But they were saying the strain that he was supplying was uh, pathogenic. It turns out it wasn't, but the EU got involved. At one time, the German government asked him for a list of uh, names and numbers of, of people, and then he, he said to them, last time German police asked for lists of people that didn't go so well. And this is like hilarious. This is like on my Facebook feed every day. Absolutely crazy. But he was at a conference recently. And so this is one of his kits that you can buy for $500. And he's recently added a human version. So if anyone wants to modify themselves, I wouldn't recommend that version. But he did. Um, he was on. So this was his like demonstration about what he was going to do. He got called out on stage at a conference, much like this one. It, don't worry, I'm not going to do it. Um, he, someone said, well, if it's so safe, why haven't you done it? So he pulled out a tattoo gun and then started uh, putting CRISPR into his muscle cells. He, what he was doing was he was trying to use, uh, trying to, to knock out a gene that produces myostatin. Myostatin inhibits fat being turned into muscle. So you've got a normal dog on the left, and this is a myostatin inhibited dog on the right. This is a mouse. Folostatin basically does the same function. So instead of going to the gym like an ordinary person, you can just sit on the couch and you will uh, turn into a beefcake. This is the idea at least. And there's a fair few people who are like very, very interested in this. Um, really interesting, brave new world. This is kind of where biohacking is now. There's like, we're on the border of lots and lots of people doing um, self-experimentation using CRISPR. This is one of them. This is one of the first, Tristan Roberts. This is actually kind of a sad story. Um, Tristan is uh, an HIV-infected teen, and he's frustrated because there's a lot of research coming out with new experimental drugs that he doesn't have access to. So he basically decided to give himself an antibody, I think it's called N9 or N7, um, that looked very promising in early clinical trials or early research, and went off his HIV medication, which the rest of the biohackers are a bit like, that's, that's pretty stupid, dude. But he thinks that it's his best solution. And I, I think what's interesting here is about uh, the ethics around uh, whether he should be able to do that and what happens if you live in a country with socialised healthcare and everyone starts GMOing themselves. Are we responsible for paying for that? And where does that responsibility shift and end? Because in Australia, we actually have, we actually have like quite a, a, um, a good history of self-experimentation with things like Helicobacter pylori, where when people don't allow you to do stuff, you kind of just do it on yourself because that's kind of, you're always allowed to do that. Okay. Speaking of self-experimentation, um, how I, what's, what time do I finish, by the way? Yeah, beautiful. I'll zip through. Oh, yeah, sweet. Okay, um, so some of you may have seen this in the news. Um, basically, um, this is an anatomy of, of an RFID card. Probably the most important things to notice are there's, there's a, a little chip in the top, and then there's an aerial. There's a few little... Um, bits off the side that are just like capacitors. But the, bi the big thing to notice is that the aerial is like quite large and quite thin and it has many, many rotations. Uh, when we first talked about hacking an Opal card to make it into an implant, the biggest problem was how do we deal with the aerial? So I've got three implants, one's in my thumb. It's really shitty because the aerial is the wrong shape to interact with the RFID field. So the way this basically works is by induction your phone or the Opal card reader will emit an RF field. When that field comes in contact, with the, uh, the aerial that will generate power through induction that will switch on the chip and that will enable it to do things. It can also send data over the same, uh, the same frequency and it can also uh, do things like charge a battery or all sorts of fun and exciting things. Basically what we needed to do was take out the chip and then um, make an aerial that would interact well with the, uh, the turnstile. This was a bit tricky though because uh, the person who manufactured it is Amal and Amal lives in uh, Seattle. So, he started designing um, some new aerials, and some of these are making it onto his other implants, uh, the most notable of which is going to be which is Vivo Key I'll talk about in a moment, and, and started testing these out, different configurations, seeing how they interact with different devices. And he, he picked this one. So this is a picture of the implant that's in my hand now before it went in. And basically he's taken the black and white section is off the Opal card, which he made by just dissolving it in acetone, and then he soldered it onto a flexible PCB. After this, it was coded. This is a much cooler coding than I got, but this is the way you do it if you, if you had like serious amounts of money to spend, uh, which is a, a chemical de deposition. This one's just kind of laminated, but in a biocompatible plastic. So you can see just 
maybe a little bit. There's, there's a plastic and there's another plastic kind of surrounding it. Um, there's a lot of different biocompatible plastics of varying cost. And this is after I got it implanted. This is me interacting with an Opal machine. And then I got in trouble. Um, they're basically saying, so I got sent this, 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 uh, this by a transit officer, transport officer. And they basically said, we're going to shut down your card. So I was very hesitant to let them scare my hand. And I think this is a, a really important thing. This is where this all kind of crosses over, which is when we asked, why do we need to give you our data when we sign up for an Opal card? Can't we just make it like anonymous, like all train tickets always have been? And they're like, no, 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 you can trust us. We'll never misuse your data. The first fucking chance they got to like misuse my data, they did. They shut down my Opal card with my name on it the day that I went and did the ABC story. So this is like um, big problems of metadata retention. So I don't trust the government as far as I can throw them with my metadata. And I think personally, I'm going to use this as leverage at the next election to start talking about um, why I think it's a bad, a bad idea for the government to have metadata retention. So out of that, I now have to go to court. Um, I'm going back on March 16th, and it will be the first uh, cyborg law case in uh, Australia, which is a bit exciting. <laughs> So um, this is, this is oh, yeah, back to the chips. So the other chip that I have in my hand is a little kind of glass bead, similar to what a pet or a, uh, like a cat or a dog might have. And there's a male in the bottom corner who manufactures and uh, designs a lot of these chips. Future directions, uh, a male's releasing a Vivo key. So this is a, a chip the same size as this one, but it can do two-factor authentication. It has a megabyte of, um, of space on it, which is huge. This, this chip in my thumb is 868 bytes. So to go from that to a meg and being able to do things like two-factor authentication on chip is a gigantic leap. Currently, production is being held up by um, not enough NFC chips of his type being available. And we're going to see uh, things like payments come out on that chip too. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of these kind of these right to access treatments and a lot of pushback from citizens against the way that things have traditionally been done. One of the big things that uh, this guy in the top left-hand corner told me was he was sitting next to a guy on a plane uh, who was involved in making pacemakers. And their business couldn't make more money because they can't make people more sick. So the way they made more money was by lo lowering the, um, the life of the battery. So they went from 10-year batteries to five-year batteries. The batteries were the same, but they only war gave them warranty for five years. And this means they could double their money. And the cost of replacing a battery in a pacemaker in America is $135,000. This is crazy. Now, if I was to get a pacemaker and I went to China, say, and got an aftermarket battery replaced and got it done over there, what would happen if I voided their warranty or their terms of use? Well, that's, that's a very extreme example, but this is the types of stuff that I think we're going to see more of, especially with access to different types of medications and gene therapies. Um, that's probably the most exciting stuff that will happen this year in biohacking. Uh, I think we'll see some ethics stuff start to come up. And uh, we're going to see a lot more grinding. So this is Tim Cannon, who's currently in Australia working on a project. And he's building awesome computers that can be embedded inside you. Probably the most interesting thing, this, this is about this big, he stuck it in his arm, is the movement away from these just kind of dumb NFC chips into things which have sensors and actuators. So this device went inside Tim's arm. It has a thermometer in it, and it connects to Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. The thermometer would control the heating in his house, so if he got too cold, it would automatically up the, the heating, which is really cool, except for when he went out for a cigarette. <laughs> his wife would start screaming at him, come back inside. Uh, so I think it's, it's, it's early days, but we're going to see a lot more of this kind of, um, uh, yeah, kind of more like what an Arduino does, you know, taking sensors in and actuating thing out, things out the other side. Um, there's some kind of decorative stuff that's happening. This is Marlowe, so he designed North Star, which is, this is, sorry if it's a bit gruesome for anyone, this is uh, the latest thing that's come out of Grindhouse, which are a team of uh, grinders from overseas, uh, from America. And they're doing things like augmenting sensors. How am I going for time? Five minutes, beautiful. Okay, so um, and this is kind of like the tail-ish end of the speech. So one of the things you can do once you have magnets implanted in your hand is you can start to interact with them. This device here is basically ultrasonic sensors that go down to magnets in the, in the glove, and then this can act like a kind of sonar. So what Tim and the Grindhouse kids would do 
is put this on, switch off all the lights, and then they, as they approached an object, it would cause the, the magnets in their fingers to vibrate quicker. So they can start thinking about what would it be like to be a dolphin. That's the kind of, and this is called the bottle, bottle nose, which is kind of cute. But they're also thinking about other things, like could I, could I create um, artworks that only people who are augmented um, be able to experience? So things that are magnetic fields, and when you put your hands across it, it would, it would vibrate in certain ways, or ways of perceiving color differently. The other cool use for this stuff is actually in magic tricks. So this is Bird. Basically, someone behind her is taking a look at what card the person picked up. Then they email, or they send an SMS to her. Her phone converts it into Morse code, and she has her hand placed on a table. Underneath the table is some magnets, and it taps out the card to her in Morse code. <laughs> I think this is one of those things that it will be like, oh, wow, how did you do that? Until everyone goes, oh, you probably just have a magnet in your finger, and then no magician can ever use it again. <laughs> um, and just to wrap up, um, so my call to action kind of thing is that um, this is Ray Kurzweil, one of the world's most famous transhumanists. He says, broadly paraphrasing, the technologies that will define our future are genetics, nanotech, and robotics, or AI. And probably the most important thing about genetics is going to be DNA storage, CRISPR, $1,000 genome, which kind of already exists, and the rise of the citizen science biohacker movement. So I highly encourage all of you to get along to BioFoundry and help us make a cool science. Thank you very much. I'll also, um, I have, just, just quickly, I have some resources. I'll email them across to Aaron. I'll put it on the website. So if anyone uh, wants to follow up on any of the things I've talked about. Yeah, great. So okay. the next slide. That was awesome. Thank Beautiful. you. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Oh, sorry, just, just, um, is there a microphone? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Most definitely. Why? So, I, I, so this is yeah. So the question was basically, why would I put proprietary technology inside my body? So I had non-proprietary technology, but I think it opens up a really interesting conversation, which is why is it proprietary from the government in the first place? How much do we have ownership over it? But honestly, for convenience is the is the the base thing. Like I want to be able to catch the train using my hand like a cyborg, which actually is very convenient. But um, I think yeah, if if I win this court case, it might actually change the way that we're able to interact with that proprietary technology. But yeah, um, that's not staying in forever. So. It was originally and then now convenience, but now what Yeah, we're open a conversation that hasn't, hasn't been had yet. So I'll go. Yeah. No, they don't show up at airports. I've been through TSA. So um, Tim, when he had that, that one, you might have seen photos. It's like, it looks like he has like an old cell phone in his arm. He went through TSA like this. It's like, ch chick's like, <laughs> and they're like, they point, and they just go like this, and they let him through. But like, that's crazy. That could have been like a lot of other things. <laughs> um, Yeah, I'm just going to put Velcro so it's easier. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, yeah, basically, I think um, when you're a beta tester in the grinding scene, you kind of accept that a lot of the things that are going in are probably going to come out. I'm pretty lucky. None of my devices have failed. I have some friends like Grindhouse uh, where their devices fail, and it's not the prettiest or nicest thing. But that's kind of comes with the territory. And this has an expiration date. It's kind of like a credit card. So even if they don't shut it down, it'll naturally expire, and then I'll get it taken out. And I'm donating it to the Powerhouse Museum. So, which is pretty cool. Did you? And then, I'll put this. I don't. Can, can you repeat? Uh, so, do, are there any problems with rejection? I don't. If anyone wants to get magnets installed, they're notoriously bad for re rejection. A lot of this has to do with the types of coatings and the thicknesses of the coatings. Some of the magnets that are coming out now 
are a lot more biocompatible. But I was speaking in this exact same spot in the IEEE conference, and there's a lot of people who are very concerned about um, batteries and magnets inside the body. I personally, I'm not too worried about magnets, but maybe batteries could cause some problems. Uh, it's an interesting space though, and, and a lot of people do have rejection, and it's not very pretty. I've read some pretty horrifying blogs about bits and stuff leaking out of people's fingers. Yeah, did you? Because it's a hundred times cooler to implant something than it is to wear it. Um, I think this is this is a big thing. There are some, there are a few little advantages. Um, uh, it's not obvious that I have anything. So if someone wanted to steal it, they would already ha they would have to know I already have it. Um, like Visa came out with a bracelet, which is like a, a payment service. But I think that's kind of dumb because it's like it can get lost just like your credit card, and I've already got a wallet. But if I had it implanted, I kind of never lose it. I can go swimming with it. Um, I think one of the big questions I ask when I'm thinking about making implants or designing them is like, could I just do it with a button? And if the answer is yes, then there's no point in kind of making it an implant. Because I think a lot of the things that people are trying to build now are kind of uh, useless. You know, someone wants to put an SD card in them, and I'm like, is that, is that good? Why not just like hide it somewhere else or put it online? Or, you know, there's a, there's a million other ways you can solve that problem. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So um, the question was, what what type of polymers are being used? There's a whole heap. Um, there's there's national there's, there's actual uh, standards in Australia about which ones are okay to use, which is a really good place to start. But most of them are pretty easy. There's um, probably the most common one is PWMA, and that's like you can just you can just buy that. Um, biocompatible silicon would would work. The only hassle is you might you just got to be careful to sterilize it before you put it in. So, and, and like that stuff, you can, you can buy that on eBay, you can buy that at Barnes in Newtown. So it just depends on like what level of risk you're, you're willing to take and how um, the person implanting it is gonna do it. So I'd highly recommend find some other people that maybe have done it before and ask, ask yeah, <laughs> what they've done. Um, going back to the uh, bio Yes. Yeah. It's fairly well controlled, so yeah. going into legislation where if I was sort of running uh, the biofoundry, mm. I'd be very worried about those aspects sort of, because it is so uncontrollable. Yeah, most definitely. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a really tricky question. Um, like, we're still subject to the same legislation that, that any other lab is. So we work very closely with government, we're very transparent with them. Um, and that was kind of needed in Australia to get us kind of to where we are. Um, we kind of, uh, we're in a peer-to-peer -peer education environment, so we know what everyone else is kind of working on, and I personally accept the risk. And that's, that's how we deal with that. Ethics, I don't really care about ethics. Unless we're dealing with animals, in which case we are required to have one. As long as you're not doing anything illegal, I don't care. Um, but, uh, yeah, so World Health Organization investigated uh, biohackers, and they said that because of the community environment, if bioterrorists were to come along, chances are they would become de-radicalized. Because often what they're, they're doing is feeling excluded from society, and that was, that was their outcome, that these spaces are good. And did we, one last question? Yeah, one last question. We're not doing work on um, female contraceptives. We are very interested in uh, other types of contraceptives as well. But Kayla Heffernan from, uh, from Melbourne is doing a PhD in what she calls insertables. And that kind of broadly takes in uh, things like IUDs as well as these and, and puts all those implantable and modifying kind of technologies into one category, which I think is a really good uh, way of doing it. But I'd highly recommend she's about to finish her PhD and she's got a huge amount um, of information in there. We wouldn't be opposed to it though. So if anyone wanted to come in and play with plant hormones and build up an implant, I'd be, I'd be keen. Awesome. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Cheers. Thank you.